Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, Theater and the Round Players, with its community of volunteers, has been presenting work on an arena stage since 1952. More than 100 pieces of correspondence from many of history's most notable composers are in the Gilman Ordway Manuscript Collection at the Schubert Club. And rock band Alpha Consumer performs. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. Theatre in the Round is a true community theatre in the sense that it is volunteer. We have two and a half paid staff and the director of each production is paid. Other than that, it is made up of people who love theatre, who love performing, who love producing, who love being backstage. It's also people who appreciate going to the theatre and seeing good theatre. And the fact that Theatre in the Round has been around for 60 years speaks to the fact that there are a lot of people in this community who love this theatre, support this theatre, and rank this theatre as one of the top-notch theatres in Minneapolis, St. Paul. If it were a person, um, the, the term Grand Dam comes to mind. It, it has been here. It has, it has sort of sat in this theatre community, which is huge and all-inclusive and it has lasted longer than any of them and so it kind of looks with pleasure and joy at all of the theater all of the arts that go on here and smiles and said yes we've done that for 60 years we love it the history of theater in the round started with directors and actors friends with each other. The first production was done at the YWCA in downtown Minneapolis, and then they moved to an arena stage on Stevens Avenue, where the convention center now is. And then when Bimbo's Pizza Parlor burned down, this property became available. And so through a lot of hard work and commitment on the part of people who love doing theater, came in, gutted the place, and with the help of some design contributions, we're able to uh, build our current building. The people that help establish this theater established it out of love, and I think that love still comes forth. And uh, as new people come in and as old people are lost and go around, there still is that real sense of family here. Theater in the Round is an arena theater. By that, it means that the audience is on all sides of the action. The theater seats about 247 people, and no seat is farther than 25 feet from the center of the stage. It's how you breathe the same air and how you are constantly engaged with the audience, no matter where you look, no matter where you turn, no matter what you have to say, there's always somebody right there looking at you, listening to you. A lot of times when you're up on a proscenium, you're kind of, the stage lights kind of flood everyone out and you can't really see anybody. And here you can see almost the entire audience. Everything you do is under extreme scrutiny and it really, I feel, it hones your skills as an actor. Every time I direct a murder here, I'm just like, well, how am I gonna kill the guy and make it look real, you know? Because it's not like you can cheat it. You can't, no cheating room. One of the things about arena staging is that there are entrances, or we call them vomitorium, or VOMs for short, that actually come through the audience. You have all these great entrances and exits, but on the same side, there's constraints within that. This is the only staircase we can use up on F. We can only block one of the VOMs, and that's tunnel. One of the advantages of being in the round is that it saves money, because you have less scenery, it's always about the floor, 
It's about the furniture. Uh, reverse side of that is that you really have to pay attention to detail because your audience is so close and on all sides of you. Everything has to be realistic. So like the London Times actually has to be the London Times. Working in the round has some challenges to it. One is that when an actor is on stage in the round, obviously their back is to some portion of the audience at all times. So that reactions of the actor have to be more than just facial reactions. They have to be something which I always call backting. It's pretty easy to make your face say what it is exactly that you want to say. However, the people behind you cannot see your face. And so it becomes your shoulders, your hands, your arms, your legs, your torso. Everything about you has to say exactly the same thing that your face is saying. Because otherwise, three quarters of the house doesn't know what your intention is. It's okay to see the back of somebody's body, but it's not okay for that person to block another person on stage. And once you've done it a few times, it's easier to do because when you're upstairs and you're directing, you just know that it's a safe spot or they need to come in more, or they need to go out more. From a directing standpoint, I would much prefer to direct in the round. You're so much more intimate with the audience and the movement overall tends to be, to me, it feels more natural. You know, you don't have to cheat out one way or the other. You can just let them move. Performing in the round is really more representational rather than presentational because you aren't just facing one direction. You are really living like you're living in a room or living in a space where you would normally not just face a certain direction just to direct ideas to an audience. You are relating to the other characters. You're relating to uh, the scenery piece as much as you would if you were existing in a room. And hopefully you can pull the audience, since they are all around you, into that. There is something very open and engaging and accepting about this place. And if you've just moved to town, you've just graduated from college, and you want some place where you can walk in the door, audition, show your chops, and get accepted, this is one of the places that will do it most easily. And if you've been here 15 times, you can walk in the door and see all kinds of faces that you know and be brought right back into the community. I keep returning to Theatre in the Round because I have a real fondness for it and to say that there's one thing about it that I like, uh, I guess it would be the people, the sense of community that this, this theater puts forth. I love how the quality is high here, the standards are high. It's such a wonderful place to be and they do such great work and they draw so many amazing directors and designers and, and actors back to the space because it's really unique in, in Twin Cities Theatre and it's and so many people have worked here so many times that anytime you come back it just kind of feels like coming home. When you take everything away, it's still at its bare bones, it's a community theatre. I mean 60 years ago people came together to build this and to have all these people come together to do something that they love just for that purpose and I think to keep the caliber and the quality and the standards as high as they do at Theatre in the Round is really kind of magical, just on its own.
The Schubert Club is a music organization based in St. Paul, dedicated to promoting the very best of music in the Twin Cities. Our music is really focused on the smallest scale of performance. Recitals, which are given by one or two performers, sometimes quartets. So it's really about the intimacy of the group and about the closeness of audience and performers with one another. Schubert Club was actually founded in 1882. We believe we're the oldest arts organization in the state. And it was founded originally as a club for ladies who were here in St. Paul without much to do and looking for entertainment. Over its long, long history, the Schubert Club has been fortunate to welcome some of the, the greatest performers from around the world. The Schubert Club has a museum which actually started in the early 1970s and since then the collection has grown to uh, many instruments, a number of manuscripts which include letters from all sorts of interesting composers as well as some of the original handwritten pieces of music. The Schubert Club has a collection of letters by famous composers that was begun in 1984 with a donation of about 20 letters from Gilman Ordway of the Ordway Center for Performing Arts family. And since that time, he's expanded his donation and our collection has grown to well over 100 letters, ranging from Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven um, all the way up to 20th century composers like Rachmaninoff and Ravel. This Beethoven letter is really uh, a note rather than a letter. It's a very small scrap of paper written in Beethoven's famous scrawl. It's in German, writing it to his friend who identifies as Z. And he's talking about he's had just attended a, a, a party or a celebration, and he's going to the Archduke's house for probably New Year's Eve or, or Christmas Eve. And he's hoping that he won't get any poisoned wine at the Archduke's house, that the food and the wine is better at the party he's going to than the one he was just coming from. And on display in our museum in downtown St. Paul are 12 letters, and we rotate that exhibit about every year and a half. One letter that we probably will always have on display is the star of our collection, which is the Mozart letter. This letter was written in 1790 to his wife, Constanza. He says, I am as excited as a child at the thought of seeing you again, but as it is, everything seems so empty. Adieu, my love, I am ever your husband who loves you with all his soul. And then he signs it, Mozart. So the touching sentiment, but then, um, which was typical, I think, at that time of just writing his last name. So I think it's exciting for classical music lovers to see their handwriting and to see something that they touched. I think that's very exciting. The other part of this is just the fact that these are letters from 150 years ago, from 200 years ago. These are the building blocks of, of what biographers use to recreate people's lives. So without these items, without these letters and the insight into the mundane, to the more extraordinary events of people's lives, we don't know how people lived 150 and 200 years ago. This is a Beckstein piano that was uh, constructed in 1878. It was played by many very famous composers, Mahler, Brahms, Bartok, Liszt. So it's a really historic instrument. We have physical objects that these composers have had in their hand and have imprinted with their writing. And to combine that with the fact that we've got instruments that they've heard and played on, this is a combination that's really quite remarkable. The Schubert Club itself um, has the history, has a fantastic concerts, education program, and the museum, but it also has so much potential, I feel, for taking the lead in what uh, performances can be. Uh, looking forwards into the future.
This piece is called Enduring Afghanistan. It is a commemoration of the American soldiers killed in Afghanistan. My name is Harriet Bart. I'm a visual artist. I work across disciplines and in a variety of media. I wanted to do a map, and it felt to me that the way to make the map was to use materials that were significant. The chain link provides a grid. It also has a built-in symbolism and meaning to it, whether it is keeping us in or keeping us out or referencing other street side memorials that seem to spring up. We think about the memorial at the 9-11 site, the fencing and the people putting things in fencing. The dog tags are a symbolic way of counting and keeping track of the soldiers who died, men and women. There's one dog tag for each American soldier killed. Most of the dog tags are where most of the deaths occur. So there's many more here than at the very top, and um, it, it will grow, I assume. When I'm working on it, I'm counting to see how deep the layers of tags are. And the deeper it gets, uh, the harder it is to maintain a grid or any sense of structure. It becomes more chaotic, um, which I suppose is a reflection of the reality of, of Afghanistan. I like the sound of it a lot. It has a kind of eerie presence. And I, when I work on it, I can hear it speaking back to me. None of the dog tags have names on them. So it is important to me to keep track of the names. So I write them all in this book. I like using the handwriting like a drawing so that each signature is complete. The other thing that happens when you do this is I can't really make any mistakes. So I have to concentrate on the name. So it becomes a kind of meditation because I look at the name, I say the name, I write the name in order to be careful to not make any errors in it. I grew up with the concept and notion of remembering. My family is Jewish. Memory is a big part of that. The book is a big part of that. And I think one of the reasons that I cherish the book is that that is a place of recording and remembering. I think that books are about possibility. They're closed, but they're full. You don't see the contents right away. I was working on a painting in my studio. I was having a lot of trouble with it. And I had a, a moment where I just stopped and I realized that the painting was about writing and about mark making. And I had one of those moments of rare and wonderful epiphany. I turned around, there was a bookshelf behind me. I took the books off the shelf and I started to arrange them on the floor. And from that point on, I used the book as an object, as a volume, as a source and resource for information and a source of inspiration. I think my love of art began gradually. I've always made things. And it wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s, that it occurred to me that I could become an artist. There were not many role models for women artists at that time. And I got involved with the Women's Art Registry of Minnesota. And we began to support each other professionally and become the role models that we didn't have. It's very hard for me to describe what I do in a single sentence, but there's a wonderful word and it's called bricolage. And bricolage is about bringing, I think, disparate things together into a unified whole. It's like working in collage, only three-dimensionally. I've been collecting tools for quite some time. Pieces of hardware, pieces of metal, typewriters. Sometimes the process begins with something that I find. Someone gave me an entire box of test tubes. I mean, a big carton of test tubes. The title of this piece is Autobiography, referencing the writing that underlies a lot of my work. 
And so there are things in here that are from books that I've read, um, detritus from various projects that I've done, public art projects, book projects, uh, things from my life. Here's a, actually a ring from when I was a, a child, my baby ring. This is some corn from a project I did for the Weissman Art Museum some years ago. This is a title of a book called Words and Things, and I liked it because that's what I do. I work with words, I work with things. There's a lot of remembrance. There are some acknowledgments of um, a sister who died, my father's not here, friend who's, who's lost, uh, some excitement and wonderful projects, the wonderful experience I had in Japan, the fun of doing the public art projects. So there's a wide range of experiences, and I think that they're in here, they're encoded, but they're in here. mixed feelings about putting something so personal on public display. I think as an artist, we are very conflicted. We do things in the studio that are private and personal, and then we're unhappy if nobody gets to see them. And then when somebody does get to see them, it makes us very anxious and protective about it. And there are stories behind all of these, some of them more personal than others. It makes me a little uncomfortable. But that's what art is about, I think, is telling the truth and a little discomfort. It's not a bad thing. came out crooked There was a one-eyed whale Learned to swim sideways You don't look back no more had had it Couldn't snap out of feeling bad Fashioned a raft and set off paddling Sighed out a final breath Threw himself at the depths Fell on a one-eyed whale I see you crying You ain't alone no more You ain't alone Alone, no 
My name is Jeremy Ilbesacker. I play the music instrument, the electric guitar music instrument in the band Alpha Consumer with Mike Lewis, who plays the bass. My name is JT Bates, and I play in a rock and roll band with uh, Michael Lewis and Jeremy Ilbesacker. I play the drums. When did you meet JT? Funny story. I was on a train. You were on a different train. <laughs> yeah, on the way. I'm like, that's right, the yeah. guy. Yeah. It was like a week ago. Oh, go ahead. It felt, felt like, a, I mean, it seems like only a week. We've all just played together a lot, yeah. <clears throat> doing different things, and some, something about this sound, there's just a lot of room for each one of us, and it's just fun. Hello, we're all in Alpha Consumer, and you're watching Minnesota Original on TPT. Fact. Yeah. Let's go. It's true. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.